Well, I'd like to welcome you all to the second, Braun, uh, uh, second annual Braun Summer Institute. Braun was founded two years ago to, quote, connect Boston area college writing and rhetoric teachers uh, for professional development and intellectual community by sponsoring free and local workshops, symposia, research collaborations, and other events, end quote. Uh, to my mind, uh, this event, the Summer Institute, perfectly embodies the ideals of our organization. Free seminars uh, and free nachos on Saturday night. <laughs> it has been a real pleasure to work. Uh, I'm Joe Bizzup, by the way. I'm the writing program director here at Boston University. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to work with Neil Lerner from Northeastern and Matt Parfit uh, from uh, BU also uh, to organize this event today. Uh, so thank Neil, Matt, thank you guys very much for that. <laughs> now, Last year, uh, last year, with support from two area institutions, uh, we were able to mount the first Summer Institute. Uh, and that was an event that involved around 60 people hailing from 22 different institutions. Uh, this year, the Summer Institute involves almost 80 people, either as facilitators or participants, representing 27 different Boston area schools, and not two but seven area schools have contributed to its support. So to begin, I would just like to thank the, the, the uh, uh, academic community here in Boston for the, the broad support they've shown to this institute. Uh, Boston University, especially the Center for, uh, uh, Center for Humanities and the College of General Studies, uh, Boston College, Emerson College, MIT, Northeastern, Stonehill College, and Wellesley College all contributed to this event. So thank you very much. I also. Um, would like to thank Bedford St. Martin's for sponsoring our Saturday evening event, uh, which is open to not only to institute participants, but to all members of the Braun community. So we hope that we'll see a lot of people there. Uh, the Summer Institute has proven to be a success in no small measure because Braun itself has been such a success. Uh, and Braun has been a success in no small measure because of the leadership and vision of its steering committee chair, our keynote speaker, Chris Gallagher. Now, when Chris came to Northeastern from the University of Nebraska in 2009, the whole Boston area writing community benefited. Chris's accomplishments are formidable. He is the author of four books, including most recently, Our Better Judgment, Teacher Leadership for Writing Assessment, uh, Teacher Leadership for Writing Assessment, 2012, as well as numerous articles in major journals, including CCC, College English, and JAC. But what I admire most about Chris is not his publication record. It is rather the commitment from which to, uh, the commitment that gives rise to that record, which is his commitment to his genuine commitment to making our educational institutions work better, uh, as evidenced by his engagement with myriad public education projects, from his service as lead evaluator for Nebraska State Assessment System, to his work uh, with the Performance Assessment Consortium in Boston to his involvement with Braun. Uh, Chris's talk today is titled, appropriately, The Public Work of Braun, A Provocation. Please join me in welcoming Chris Gallagher. Thanks, Joe, and thanks to Joe and Matt and Neil for inviting me to give the keynote. I didn't even twist their arm to make me uh, get up here in front of you today, so I really appreciate that. Um, and welcome to all of you. I know the next few days are going to be uh, both warm uh, and enjoyable for you, and you'll learn a lot, I know, from the, from the great folks that we've gathered here today. Is John Brereton here yet? Okay, good, because I'm going to embarrass him <laughs> in just a moment. A year ago, in his wonderful opening address to the inaugural Braun Summer Institute, John Brereton, probably right here at this spot, situated our work together as Braun in two ways. First, as a kind of educational process, and second, as an engagement of a certain kind of knowledge, or making of a certain kind of knowledge. This morning, I want to reflect on both of those themes. That is, I want to take up questions of how we Brauniacs make knowledge and what knowledge we make. Along the way, I also want us to think together about with whom we make knowledge, and to what ends. So first, the how. As those of you who are here will recall, John likened Braun to an invisible college. 
which he defined as any informal grouping of investigators gathered outside of a normal educational institution for the purpose of teaching each other. He drew compelling com uh, parallels between Braun and a range of historical and contemporary invisible colleges, including and especially the CUNY Association of Writing Supervisors, the National Writing Project, the Breadloaf Conference, and several summer institutes at places like University of Detroit Mercy College, Purdue, University of New Hampshire, Kent State, Ohio State, and many more. And he claimed that these have given rise to the discipline that we now variously call rhetoric and composition or composition studies or writing studies. I like thinking of Braun in these terms, mostly because we're defined here by our abnormality outside of the normal educational institutions. Weirdness, after all, is perhaps the defining characteristic of a network whose mottos have included some folks got brawn, brains, we got brawn, and Sebastian will remember this one. <laughs> Some of us are hopeful there will be alcohol. But though it doesn't fit very well on a bumper sticker, maybe John put it best when he said, nothing beats getting together a bunch of interested teachers with some facilitators to discover together some better ways of teaching writing. That looked like a bumper. Even as I want to hold John's notion of an invisible college, even as I want to hold on to it, I'd like to explore an alternative or maybe complementary framing of the work of Braun as a counterpublic. Now, I recognize that this sounds less cool and maybe sort of severe, maybe even forbidding counterpublic, but there's something here I'd like to tease out, and it has to do with what it is we're making together and with whom. As a college, of course, we're interested in making knowledge. An invisible college makes knowledge. And John provided an instructive overview last year of how the invisible colleges of composition and rhetoric have helped and continue to help create a discipline that knows something about rhetorical and process pedagogies, research methods, assessment, multilingual writers and writing, academic integrity, writing centers, writing across the curriculum, writing in the disciplines, composing with new media, reading, and much more. John didn't talk explicitly about public, civic, or community engagement, but I'm sure you'd agree that this too has been an important part of the field for a long time. And especially in light of what our own Paula Matthew calls the public turn in composition and more broadly in English studies. The public turn, an umbrella term under which we might place public writing, service learning, community literacy, activist scholarship, and related activities, is partly about new ways of making knowledge with students and community members. Some teachers and scholars have framed it as a reclamation of our intellectual roots in civic rhetoric, while others have promoted it as a way to give students, quote, real world writing experience. But one turn within the public turn that I find particularly interesting and useful is toward the idea that we and our students and community members are involved not just in making knowledge, but also in making publics. Viewed this way, as Frank Farmer argues in his recent book, After the Public Turn, the public turn is in part a response to our field's dissatisfaction with the publics we inhabit. And the public work of rhetoric and composition is to intervene in and help shape or reshape those publics. In truth, this idea isn't new, as a lot of you know. Uh, James Slevin, for example, has argued that composition might best be described not as a discipline or a professional field, but rather as an intellectual and social movement designed to push back against political, social, and economic domination and exclusion within, by, and beyond institutions of higher education. Similarly, I think of the work of John Trimber, who also is a member of Braun and has been instrumental in our work together, and do pick up his solidarity and service if you haven't already, whose work advances the notion that the purpose of writing instruction is to promote rhetorical agency and popular participation in public life. <coughs> Farmer, again, also stands with and draws on scholars such as Susan Wells, Sharon Crowley, Nancy Welch, and others who demonstrate, to my mind convincingly, 
that contra utopian narratives about new media opening up vast swaths of public space and discourse, it's instead the case that public spheres and public discourses we inhabit have increasingly become restricted, polarized, attenuated, fragmented, commercialized, colonized, and all but abandoned under pressure from a neoliberal agenda dead set on privatizing all public space, public lands, public bandwidth, community airways, and so on in pursuit of profit. Alliterative, yes, <laughs> but also depressing. <clears throat> but what I've called the turn within the public turn also offers, I think, a measure of hope. If publics are made and presumably remade, they're not immutable, they're not inevitable. Indeed, as Michael Warner suggests, publics exist by virtue of being addressed. I wish this showed up better, James. <laughs> Can you see it? Yeah. yeah. All right, good. So here's Farmer <laughs> channeling Warner. The person speaking is in search of a like-minded like others who might also be disposed to inhabit the same discursive space. Public discourse then in its very saying, proclaims not merely let a public exist, but also let it have this character, speak this way, see the world this way. Or as Warner puts it, run it up the flagpole and see who salutes. <laughs> Put on a show and see who shows up. And look, you did. This is last year's Braun Inaugural Institute. You showed up, there you are, you exist. When an adolescent-sized handful of us met a couple years ago in a small conference room in a ramshackle building in Northeastern's campus and imagined we might conjure you by various means of rhetorical address, a summer institute, a listserv, a website, social media, we weren't entirely sure you'd materialize. But you have, in force, as Joe described earlier, Brian has become a public. We make it and remake it, all of us, each time we address each other as Braniacs. But I talked about counterpublics, not just publics, right? Drawing primarily from the work of Nancy Fraser and Michael Warner, Farmer describes counterpublics as oppositional social formations created to maintain and maintained to offer alternative worlds for their members. Farmer writes, to qualify as a counterpublic, the minimal requirements are generally acknowledged to be the following an oppositional relationship to other more dominant publics, a marginal, subaltern, or excluded status within the larger public, and an identity wrought by and refined through the reflexive circulation of texts. If you've read much scholarship in rhetoric and composition, you likely know where this is headed. This is playing right into our island of misfit toys ethos. And on cue, Farmer proposes that rhetoric and composition itself functions as a kind of counterpublic. I'm prepared to agree that the term has some descriptive accuracy and explanatory power when applied to the field. Take a look at the narrow, decontextualized, a rhetorical conceptions of writing and the teaching of writing that circulate in the wider public and are enshrined in educational and language policies. Consider what passes for a writing test, even today at a moment when, as John noted last year, we have established all the disciplinary trappings one might wish for, academic journals, professional organizations, national and international conferences, book series, graduate programs, the lot. If anything, the Spellings Commission, academically adrift, and the rise of automated essay scoring suggest that the rise, or that the wider public's understanding of writing is becoming more aggressive and its stance toward our knowledge and expertise is getting more dismissive. I mean, when Stanley Fish is speaking for you, you know you're at best marginalized, probably excluded, and you'd better get on with being oppositional. I know that's mean, but I kind of <laughs> In any event, I'll predict that rhetoric and composition will warmly embrace Farmer's notion that it functions as a disciplinary counterpublic. Disciplinary counterpublics these seemingly oxymoronic beasts, Farmer writes, tend to savor their unofficial status, delight in their outsider perspectives, and freely confess their transgressions, even when they have no need to be forgiven for their wayward ways. To be a disciplinary counterpublic means never having to say you're sorry. 
at least not for going public with your inquiries and arguments. And if a field could nod its head in collective agreement, Copret would be giving itself whiplash right now. We <laughs> eat this stuff up. But I love rhetoric and composition, I must say. Um, and I do think that rhetoric and composition has a counterpublic imagination. Certainly, as farmer writes of counterpublics in general, we yearn for the kind of social imaginary that would accommodate more encompassing visions of publicness. We harbor, and here again, farmers quoting Warner, the hope of transforming not just policy, but the space of public life itself. But the thing about counterpublics is that they're engaged in poetics. This is a word that Farmer makes quite a lot of. They're world making. So we must judge them by the worlds they make, not just the worlds they imagine. I'm going to have to go back and show the slides of John now. <laughs> At their best, Counterpublics make new worlds, not only for their members, but also for other counterpublics and publics, including the wider public. They are in this way expansive, inclusive, constructive, and creative, making room, creating space for more voices, more ways of thinking, and more ways of being. So, rhetoric and composition. I adore its ragamuffin sense of self, its big tent mentality, and most of all, and I'm quite serious about this, it's core commitments to writing, teaching, and learning. To have built a discipline around these activities is no small matter. It's been my professional home for my entire career, and it's allowed me to think and write and say and do things in ways that I doubt I've had, I'd have had the opportunity to otherwise. But look, the world the composition and rhetoric has made while perhaps capacious and inclusive relative to other disciplines, is, by dint of its professionalization and institutionalization, exclusive, insular, and inward-looking by nature, despite and even in the midst of the public turn. It gives me no pleasure to say this, but read the journals, go to the conferences, hell, attend most graduate seminars, and you'll see that we are mostly white, middle-class academics talking to other mostly white academics. Sure, we have the good grace to feel bad about it. And we talk a lot to each other about this. But I don't know that we've done a whole lot to change it. And I don't know that as a discipline, we frankly could. I'm going to come back to that in a second. But here's one example of what I'm talking about. Last year marked the 25th anniversary of Steve North's important, if unlovely, the making of knowledge and composition, in which he argued that practitioners, writing teachers, were marginalized as small c composition became large c composition, or what I've been calling rhetoric and composition in the 1960s. In 2013, there are vast numbers of writing teachers who feel only a glancing connection to, these, to, to those field-defining trappings I just mentioned. Many community college teachers, for instance, don't feel welcome at four Cs, don't see their context represented in most of the journals of the field outside of a couple specialized ones, and don't see graduate programs training people to take on the kind of work done at their institutions. And even if these resources were targeted to them, many of these folks don't have time or the means to access them. The same is largely true for term contract, contingent, adjunct, teachers across all institution types, these teachers are far more diverse than the publishing scholars at research-intensive institutions, and they make knowledge with their students and with community members often, every day, in and from their classrooms. But they're effectively cut off from official knowledge-making enterprise that is the field of rhetoric and composition. And in fact, this is one of the reasons we started Braun in the first place, to help build a network that would connect folks who often don't, for whatever reason, feel the kind of connection to the discipline that their daily work should entitle them to. So the hard truth is that CompRet as a field has done a much better job creating a com comfortable academic perch for a small number of its members than it has creating an expansive and inclusive counterpublic, much less, as Farmer put it, transforming the space of public life itself. 
In the end, Farmer is himself a bit squirrely on this question of whether the field, as the field, can be a counterpublic as opposed to function like one in certain circumstances. He recognizes that traditional notions of academic expertise, especially regarding something as seemingly mundane and commonsensical as writing, is bound to be domesticated and circumscribed. Q fish again, in the broader discourse. So, my own sense, though, is that he underestimates the extent to which the field has come to trade on and define itself by its traditionally conceived academic expertise. As John Trimber has taught me, and there he is teaching me. <laughs> I'll let that sink in. What do you think he was saying? I embarrass everyone now. I have to embarrass myself. Our will to disciplinarity exists in tension with our desire to stand with and support the interests of ordinary people. And those of you who know John know that that's probably exactly what he was saying in that dark bar. Right? <laughs> you know, Chris? But here I think we arrive at the great value of invisible colleges. They can serve, if I may shamelessly mix my metaphors, as construction zones for counterpublics as, again, informal groupings of investigators gathered outside of normal educational institutions for the purpose of teaching each other, they're in large me measure unaccountable to institutional and disciplinary dictates, even if they draw on institutional resources and disciplinary knowledges. They can be as expansive and inclusive as their resources will allow. They can position everyone as a teacher and everyone as a learner. And this is what I love most about Braun. Everyone teaches and everyone learns. If you are a Boston area teacher of college writing, and we define that broadly, we believe that you have something to offer and something to be offered. You don't need money. All you need is some time and a willingness to participate, to share what you know, and to learn from others. All of our means of rhetorical address our writing groups, reading groups, storytelling sessions, classroom visit exchange program, listserv, are designed as informal gatherings where people, irrespective of, of their institutional affiliations, ranks, years of experience, etc., teach and learn together. Even here at our most formal event, the Summer Institute, facilitators, who themselves, I hope you've noted, hold various ranks and hail from diverse institutions, are charged not simply with sharing their expertise, although certainly they'll do that, but also with setting the conditions for collaborative knowledge making. It's true that as an uninstitutionalized, undisciplined <clears throat> organization, Braun is often less efficient and messier than one might like. Most of our protocols are ad hoc. We have very little institutional structure, organizational structure. This means we sometimes throw together things at the last minute, not the Summer Institute guys, <laughs> but some things. It may mean that we miss some valuable opportunities, but it also means that we have flexibility. We have nimbleness. We can move quickly when we decide to act, and we don't need anyone's permission. See, I sort of feed into that same thing, too. I am a compositionist, after all. See how cool we are? <laughs> Mostly to date, the actions that we've undertaken as Braun have been designed to build the network by distributing by distributing information and connecting people for informal engagements around writing and the teaching of writing. Thanks mostly to James Stanfield. Yes. <laughs> Built a robust web communication and social media profile with a website, a listserv, Facebook page, Twitter account, LinkedIn account. We've also planned, hosted, and facilitated a range of other activities, including fall and spring receptions, a well-attended reception at the MLA convention, um, stories of the profession storytelling series. My daughter had something last night, I'm so sorry, but people say it was awesome last night, so I'm glad to hear that. Reading and writing groups, writing retreats, graduate student meetups, cross-institutional classroom observations, and of course the summer institutes. Oh, I think I have some photos. <laughs> Let me just click through these. And if you see anything that seems noteworthy, you can, you can let me know. <clears throat> Beer already? Oh. Oh. Hmm. And there's Joe. And we're, we're back around to home. 
as this list and these photos suggest, we like to talk, we like to socialize, and we like to do these things as often as possible in bars. Yeah, I own one shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I owns one shirt. <laughs> Sorry. Right. I should have warned you. I am a compositionist after all. I didn't. <laughs> Ragamuffin. But if there's one thing I know about Brawniacs is that they don't need an excuse to do these things, and they have plenty of other people to do them with, and some of those people don't talk about work all the time. But we're hungry for these events. We want to teach and learn from each other outside the dictates of our normal, rule-bound, institutional lives. This is indeed the core activity of Braun. Which makes sense, because remember, counterpublics are oppositional social formations created and maintained to offer alternative worlds for their members. We believe college writing teachers, largely underpaid, underappreciated, overworked, and often under attack for not solving the country's permanent literacy crisis while fueling the engine of America's global dominance, need an alternative world where their knowledge and expertise and perspectives are valued and honored. We imagine Braun, at least in part, as a safe house in the contact zone. As a network, then, we strive to serve the needs of our members by creating a counterpublic in which Boston area teachers of writing can come together to learn from each other. We want these spaces to be inclusive and participatory in ways that other publics and the wider public so often are not. And we've, come, we've had some success, lots of Facebook likes, lots of Twitter followers. We're being followed, by the way, if you haven't noticed, James pointed this out to me by Kairos, RSA, Writing Lab Newsletter, Three Cs, and colleagues, writing programs, and writing centers across the country. We have 182 listserv members from 45 area institutions. We've recently diversified the steering committee by welcoming two new members, Kristen Getchell of Curry College, is she here? Kristen's here. <laughs> and Lorianne DiSabato of Framingham State and Southern New Hampshire, right? She down here. In fact, with the members of the steering committee who are here, please be recognized. Suzanne is here, James is here, Josh is here, Mark is here, Steve is here. The steering committee now includes representatives from nine different institutions. If you look around this room, as Joe mentioned earlier, you'll see colleagues from 27 different institutions. 27. And of virtually every description you could think of, two-year college, liberal arts college, private research institution, public research university, regional state school, conservatory, professional schools, right? So we're running the gamut. For an organization barely two years old with no budget and no staff, <laughs> these numbers are pretty remarkable. Of course, we could always do more. We're always on the lookout for ways to diversify our membership and leadership and to provide avenues of participation for any Boston area writing teachers who harbor the simple desire to teach and learn with others who do what they do. We welcome your ideas about how to improve on that front and I think on Sunday there's going to be a session where the steering committee will welcome your ideas for the organization so we look forward to that. I am not by the way going to be there uh, and I'll tell you why because I feel bad about it but it's a good excuse. Um, some of you will know that one of the original Founders of Braun and steering committee members was Patricia Sullivan, who worked at Northeastern University at the time. She has now moved on, and she's getting married tomorrow. So I'm going to her wedding to Jim Sykes, who's also a compositionist. Um, so that seems like a pretty good excuse to get out of Braun, even though I would not want to if I had the choice. Okay, but a little bit more on counterpublics. As Farmer describes them in Warner and others, um, they look both ways. They look both inward and they look outward. Even as they provide safe spaces for their members, they attempt to shape other publics, counter or otherwise, including, of course, the wider public. They are, after all, oppositional, not just alternative. This is the public work I believe Braun is ready to do, even as it continues the wonderful work it's doing in making, self, it's, making itself a safe space for Boston area college writing teachers. And before I go further, because I'm going to get a little bit more specific here, I want to tell you that I'm speaking now as a member of Braun, as an educator, uh, as somebody who likes to think of himself as an education activist. I'm not speaking as chair of the steering committee. 
Um, what I'm laying out here is less a program for Braun to follow, that would violate just about every principle we hold dear, uh, than it is a provocation that I hope members, starting with you here today, will take up in whatever ways they or you see fit. I also want to acknowledge that the kind of public work I'm imagining here would mean not only more work for the unpaid volunteers who run the organization, but a different kind of work from what we've done so far. It would involve vetting issues and stances, developing consensus building processes, forging coalitions, engaging in action planning, mobilizing activists. At the same time, this, and by this I mean the work of making publics and counterpublics, is the public work of rhetoric. Although traditionally we think of rhetoric in terms of an individual speaking or speaker addressing an audience, Quintilian's vaunted good man speaking well, scholars such as Nancy Welch and Jeff Grable have theorized collective models of rhetoric in which ordinary people engage in mass rhetorical action. These models are designed to recognize, honor, and mobilize the making of publics and counterpublics, and thus the expansion of the participatory public sphere. Grable, I think, is, is particularly um, useful for us for these purposes. For Grable, rhetoric is coordinated and distributed action. Coordinated and distributed. I like the productive tension these terms create, one pulling inward, the other pushing outward. To coordinate is to work together in harmony, to combine, to link together. To distribute is to divide, to dispense, to send out, to spread. These are both essential functions of networks. As I envision, envision it, Braun's coordination work involves linking internally and externally, connecting people for collective action. Braun's distribution work involves delivering our collaboratively produced knowledge through collective action, again internally and externally. Through our coordinated and distributed rhetorical action, I propose that the public work of Braun is to help make sh more inclusive and participatory publics, thereby expanding the public sphere for broader and more diverse democratic deliberation and decision making. More alliteration for you. The word help in that sentence is important. I envision Braun coordinating and distributing knowledge and action with other community organizers, other public builders, other ordinary people. The fact is we're surrounded by counterpublics and invisible colleges. Organizations, projects, networks, groups woven into and weaving the fabric of our communities. One more time, recall John's definition. An invisible college is any informal grouping of investigators gathered outside of normal educational institutions for the purpose of teaching each other. This happens every day in our city, and this happens across our communities and our neighborhoods. And it happens every day in our discipline, too. I like to see us connect with our allies in our communities and in our discipline to assume a public voice on important educational and literacy matters. For example, I'd like to see us address the deplorable labor practices in higher education with, which disproportionately affect teachers of writing. I'd like to see us address automated essay scoring and other assorted assessment sins. I'd like to see us address the common core standards and the emerging assessments that purport to be si tied to college readiness. I'd like to see us address the resegregation of the nations, including and especially Boston schools, and its impact on college going and college completing rates, especially for poor and minority students. I'd like to see us address the disenfranchisement of two-year college teachers by the profession. I'd like to see us address the regressive, false, and often insulting representations of writing, the teaching of writing, students writing, teachers of writing, in the wider public. And I'd like to see us address the radical shrinking of the public sphere and the vanishing opportunities, especially for young people in our culture, to engage in meaningful and productive public deliberation and decision making. Note that I'm not suggesting exactly how we should do these things or exactly what stances we should take on them. Those matters can only be decided collectively. I'm simply suggesting the kinds of issues on which bronze brawn might be brought to bear in productive ways. <laughs> Above all, I'd like to see us address whatever issues members believe would best serve the goals and needs and leverage the expertise of the network. I also want to call attention one more time to my use of the word address. Recall that publics are made by means of rhetorical address 
Indeed, what I'm suggesting is that now that Braun is a public, it's time to think about publics for Braun. In closing, I want to acknowledge that I know some people, probably some in the room, will feel that Braun should stay small, quiet, internally focused, invisible. For some, a safe space in the contact zone is quite enough. They may say that our efforts should go to nurturing and protecting that space. I understand this sentiment, but I don't think we need to make a choice. Let us declare now and for always that the beating heart of Braun will always be found in the bar rooms of Boston. <laughs> and let us affirm that our Invitational Summer Institute for Teachers of Writing is our crown jewel. But also let's complement our pub going with public advocacy. Let's leverage our professional expertise for public engagement. Let's parlay our collegiality into coalition building. As John reminded us last year, invisible colleges have a way of becoming visible. <laughs> the original invisible college gave rise to the Royal Society. The CUNY Association of Writing Supervisors helped give rise to the field of rhetoric and composition. I have no idea what Braun will give rise to. That's up to all of us. But my best hope for it is that, in Farmer's words, quote, we may yet commence the work of making a different kind of public for ourselves, our students, and other citizens who find themselves, for whatever reason, positioned somewhere on the outskirts of full public participation. Let this be our public work to contribute through coordinated and distributed rhetorical action to making more inclusive and expansive, more democratic publics. Thank you. <laughs>